This morning, we're going to discover if your answer is an ish or a less. An ish or a less. This morning's lessons, you're probably all worried if you were actually listening as the lessons were being read. Because what is today's lessons about? What? Sharing or goods or ma- who said that? Money, right? What greed? What happens when when the texts are about money? What does the pastor always talk about? Money, right? You're supposed to give to the church, and if you don't give your gifts to the church, then that's not good. Well, guess what? I'm not going to say that, even though I already did, because that's really not what this lesson is about. Right. It is about greed. Don't get me wrong, because Jesus says, don't be greedy. Right. Don't guard yourself against all kinds of greed. But what is it really and ultimately about? This passage is ultimately not about money. It's about something else. It's about God's blessing blessing and an ish or less. See, the story is about a man, right, who has so much stuff in a barn that's overabundantly filled. And when, the, when, the, when his crops come in, he has no place to store all of his, his new crops. So he talks to himself, right? Did you read that in there? Who does the man talk to? He talks to himself. I just said that a minute ago. So it was not, it was a, it was, that was an easy question, right? I gave you the answer. He sits down. And and his land produced so much, and he sat down and he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store my grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, you have ample goods laid up for years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Who else is in this man's life? Isn't that sad? He's all alone. He's by himself. And all of his conversation is with himself. And it's all about me. It's not about my family that I'm going to take care of. I'm going to take down this barn and build a, and build a bigger one because we had ample crops and it's going to help to take care of my family for years. My family and my friends. It's not that. It says I. I. My. My. I. 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 It leads to what I've heard, talked about before as the unholy trinity. Right? What, does anybody remember what the unholy trinity is? Me, myself, and I. Right. It's all about me, myself, and I. It's all about what I do for myself and what I get from it. And it actually stems back even to the beginning here, right? Because the, what, what is Jesus' impetus for telling this story? Jesus is asked a question by a man. And the man comes to Jesus and he says, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. How many of you have ever gone through something like that? Right? Families can be all warm and fuzzy until something happens and somebody passes and then there's an inheritance involved. Because then what happens? It gets ugly. It gets ugly. The gloves come off, the claws come out, we all get upset about what I'm not getting, right? And that's not what it's about. This story, this man comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, be the arbitrator. Tell my brother to divide stuff with me. Does anybody know? What the actual Old Testament says about the vision of inheritance? Say it louder. How much? Do you remember? We talked about this in confirmation. I know we did. Not all of it. The older brother gets the double portion. So if there's two brothers, the older brother gets two thirds of the estate. The younger brother, they take, they, they, they take care of the younger brother, right? They give him a third of the estate. But the older brother gets twice as much as anybody else. So if there's four brothers, the older brother gets half, right? On down the line. So this man comes to Jesus and says, tell my brother to divide. And how is he asking Jesus to divide it? Well, we, yeah, we assume 50-50. But we don't know. But he comes to Jesus and says, tell him to divide the inheritance with me. And what's the underlying thing there? Is it really about the money? Is it really about what he's going to get? Or is it about him taking care of myself? 
You see, we look at this passage and we think that Jesus says, or God says, that anyone who's rich is not going to make it. Which is an absolute lie. Because I have a wonderful family who I'm still friends with from my first congregation, the congregation I left to go to seminary in North Carolina. Um, who He was a thriving rep. Right At that point it was Lutheran Brotherhood. Um, but today he's a thriving rep. Um, and he gave, they gave a very nice amount of money every month. And based upon how his customers did, right? Because thriving reps make money based upon how their customers do in the market. That's the way that those financial things work, right? Based upon the amount of money they gave, they gave a base amount each month. And then up and above that, they gave over and above depending upon how good of a month they had, right? So you were guaranteed this amount. If they had a good month with their customers, he would give this much. They would give much more. Did they still have enough money to do all this stuff? Oh yeah, they had nice houses on the beach and boats and all kinds of stuff. When people say that rich people don't make it, I always think of that family and I go, no, because that family got it. If someone was in need, who was the first family that was always there to help? They were. And it it sounds like I'm building this family up and I am, but this is the way that God wants us all to live. Because we've been, each and every one of us has been richly blessed with gifts beyond imagination, right? And in our country, it actually should preach this really hard against greed because every last one of us is rich in comparison with the rest of the world, right? And how many people in here would consider yourself to be rich monetarily? <laughs> See, that was a trick question. <laughs> how many of you would consider yourselves to be rich? How many of you would consider yourself to be rich monetarily? Actually, every one of us should raise our hand because we're all in the top 5% of the world's economies, right? And that's a statistic that I made up right here on the spot. Please don't quote me on that statistic. (laughs) That might be wrong. Um, But Jesus says to this brother, who made me judge over you? And then he tells him a story about a man who has an abundance, an overabundance, and he says to himself... I, 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 me, 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 my, my, my. Take down my bard, build a new one, store all my stuff. And God says to him, what? You fool. He doesn't say sinner. He doesn't say you're wrong. He doesn't say you haven't been living the life I've called you to. He calls him a fool. Because he doesn't understand how richly and abundantly he's been blessed and why. Richly and abundantly, he's been blessed. See, it ultimately comes down to us understanding, as Martin Luther once said, and this is not an exact quote, but God needs neither our good works nor our wealth, but our neighbors do. You see, God blesses each and every one of us in many and various different ways so that we can do what? Store up those things and hold them and give them back to God when he finally calls us home? No, because you can't take it with you. You came here screaming, you're going to go back, not screaming, hopefully joyful that you're there, but with nothing. You came into this world with nothing, and you're leaving it with nothing. Save the grace of God. So God blesses you to be a blessing. It's kind of like this story from Florence Ferrier. It's about a social worker who worked in poverty-stricken Appalachia, and it's called We Ain't Poor. The Sheldons were a large family in severe financial distress after a series of misfortunes. The help they received was not adequate, yet they managed their meager income with ingenuity and without complaint. One day, I visited the Sheldons in a ramshackle rented house they lived in at the edge of the woods. Despite a painful physical handicap, Mr. Sheldon had shot and butchered a beer, which bear... Not a beer. Boy, that's a Freudian slip. Watch out. (laughs) Despite the painful and physical handicap, Mr. Sheldon had shot and butchered a bear, which had strayed into their yard once too often. The meat had been processed in all of the big canning jars they could find and or swap for. There would be meat in their diet even during the worst of winter when their fuel costs were high. Mr. Sheldon offered me a jar of bear meat, I hesitated to accept it, but the giver met my unspoken resistance firmly. Now you just have to take it. 
We want you to have it. We don't have much. That's a fact, but we ain't poor. And I couldn't resist asking, what's the difference? His answer proved unforgettable. When you can give something away, even when you don't have much, you ain't poor. When you don't feel easy giving something away, even if you got more than you need, then you're poor, whether you know it or not. I accepted and enjoyed their gift and treasured the lesson in living. In time, I saw it as a spiritual lesson too, knowing that all we have is provided by the Father. It seems ungracious to doubt that our needs will be met without our clinging to every morsel. When I feel myself resisting an urge to share what's mine, or when I see someone sharing freely from the little that they have, I remember Mr. Sheldon saying, we ain't poor. So the question is, are you an ish or less? And if you haven't figured it out yet, you need to look at the sermon title. Self blankness. How do you fill in the blank? Because God has blessed you beyond imagination. And each and every one of us has gifts and things to share. So are we selfish with our gifts? Or are we selfless with our gifts? Knowing that God is always going to be there to walk with us through whatever it is that we face and to continually bless us again and again. So are you an ish or less?